Now, half a lifetime ago, literally, I was fitter and more active. And it was a time when I played football every single day, whether rain or shine. After school, I'll be there. And there was one day I, I had just bought a new pair of boots meant for those artificial grass fields, you know. Uh, I was very excited, so I put them on and I played. But in school, we would usually play on hard basketball courts, right? And that day, it happened that it rained and the ground was very wet. So it made my boots unsuitable because with them, the ground became extremely slippery. And after slipping a few times, my friends told me to change back to normal shoes, say, Ayah, why, why, why are you wearing this? Just wear your normal shoes, it'll be better. However, after they said that, right, it had the opposite effect on me. Because emboldened by the fact that I had successfully and perhaps skillfully managed to avoid all the slip-ups so far, I told them not to worry because nothing will surely happen to me. And in my head, I was thinking, ah, yeah, what's so difficult about treading a little bit more carefully while playing? And that was when it happened. I slipped. And it was a terrible one, okay? It's like this, you know, your... Your, your, your elbow goes on like that, and I sat down on it. And I remember I was in that position, I was squatting down, I was wincing in so much pain, but yet I refused to let out any sound <laughs> as I was dealing with that onslaught of sharp, sharp pain. And my friends, those days, right, I used to walk to school and walk back home every single day. And my friends told me to take a taxi to go home. But poor me then as a kid with so much pride and literally poor as well, I refused to do so. So that day I walked back home as I normally did and I hobbled all the way back and regretted every single step. And in the end, I was out for three months, no physical activity, and up to today, you know, like how we do anchor rotation exercises, right? Up to today, uh, occasionally, I'll still hear clicks when I'm rotating my ankle. And that day, I learned a terrible structure experience on the power of pride and paid the price for it. And you know what I want to tell you today? Yep, that's right. As the title of today's message says, don't fall for it. Turn to any of us and say, don't fall for it. Because it will only be ouch for you and me. But first, let's understand what pride is. And contrary to the stomach in, chest out kind of puffing up that pride promises, you know, like you see in NDP, right? The color party, right? Then instead of that kind of stomach in, chest out puffing up, uh, that pride promises, I want to present to you that pride in fact, weakens you. When we think of the story of how the first humans, Adam and Eve, ate that forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden, we often think of it as a story of how the devil successfully displayed or demonstrated his prowess in deceit, in lying. And the, Bible's, the Bible affirms this deceitful nature of the devil in John 8, 44, where it is said that lies are his native language. And he is called the father of lies. And the condensed biblical version of the fall, as we read in Genesis 3, is that he lied to Eve about the consequence of eating the forbidden fruit. And she bought it, took the fruit, ate it, and gave it to her, some to her husband, Adam, who ate it as well. So reading this, we may be further tempted to give the devil all the credit because reading the account for those of us who know in the Bible, in Genesis 3, we will realize that this crafty enemy did not go after the head of the household, Adam, who had directly received God's command not to eat that forbidden fruit. Instead, naughty, naughty, he went after Eve, who clearly had a lot of influence over her husband. And however, after putting up a small struggle with the devil, came this pivotal moment in verse 5 between the exchange uh, with Eve and the devil. It says this, Genesis chapter 3, verse 5 says, For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened 
and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. This is a pivotal moment in the conversation. The devil says, you will be like God. And that was exactly the devil's ambition himself, why he was even cast out of heaven in the first place, because he wanted to be like the most high God. And he was going to corrupt God's crowning jewel of all creation with that same desire, a warped and prideful sense of self-importance. He probably figured, you know, that if a superior angelic being like himself could be filled with such a desire, then a creation made from dust wouldn't be able to withstand such a corruption of desires. Let's read on in verse 6 to see what happened next. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Now, taking the form of a serpent. The devil's approach was simple yet deadly. First, he arrogantly contradicted what God had said to Eve about eating the forbidden fruit, and then later on, he charged God with lying. Now, this shocking rejection of God's word introduced Eve to the revelation, to the possibility for the very first time of unbelief. Unbelief meaning Oh, okay, so I can choose to reject God's word? Hmm. And then also aroused doubt in her mind for the first time about the truthfulness and reliability of God. Wow, is God telling the truth when he said you will surely die? For the first time, unbelief and doubt crossed into Eve's mind about God. And then the devil drew her into deeper deception by suggesting that God's reasons for lying was to keep her from enjoying all the possibilities of being God-like. And it's a masterstroke aimed at undermining her confidence in the goodness and love of God and also arousing her desire to be like God. Now this desire to lift up and exalt ourselves beyond our place as God's creation lies at the heart of God. Pride. The appeal to be God-like made her begin to look at the forbidden fruit in a new way. It became good for food and pleasing to the eye. And as desire increased, she rationalized and experienced a corresponding erosion of the will to resist and say no. Finally, weakened by unbelief, enticed by pride, and trapped by self-deception, she opted for autonomy and disobeyed God's command. In just a few deft moves, the devil was able to use pride to weaken mankind and bring about our downfall. Now, once the first humans, Adam and Eve, acted upon corrupted desires, the consequences of death, childbearing pain, and uh, lifelong toiling in work became reality, just as God promised. And till today, the devil has never stopped using this proven and tested method of bending us to his lies. And that's why the Apostle John warned us against the devil's tactics in stealing our hearts and obedience away from God all over again as happened to to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden because of these things called selfish ambition and pride. Let us read what he says in 1 John 2, 15 to 17. It says this, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Now, do you see the commonality here? What John warns warns us against, the lust of the flesh, the corresponding one, as used in the Garden of Eden, is that Eve suddenly realized, good for food. The last of the eyes, Eve suddenly realized, pleasing to the eye. And the pride of life, Eve suddenly realized, desirable for gaining wisdom. Now, what John is warning us against here is the ancient but 
all too familiar method employed by the devil that confronts each of us daily. You know, as a great Christian author, C.S. Lewis expertly put it, the utmost evil is pride. It was through pride that the devil became the devil, and pride leads to every other vice, every other sin. It is the complete anti-state, anti-God state of mind. However, listening to this thus far, maybe some of us would be tempted to easily conclude that pride is not me. It is reserved only for this. It's a special problem reserved only for those who are rich, powerful, successful, famous, or self-righteous. But that is wrong. Pride takes many shapes and forms and affects all of us to some degree. Pride can be summarized as that state or that attitude of self-sufficiency, self-importance, and self-exaltation in relation to God. And towards others is an attitude of looking down on others and thinking that they do not matter, people do not matter. After all, the letter I is at the center of pride. And it was pride that caused the devil to be cast out of heaven and that caused Adam and Eve to be cast out of Eden. And our lives will eventually become undone if we tolerate pride in our lives. If you're still not very sure whether pride is a concern of yours, then maybe some of these questions will help us to have a clearer evaluation. So let me just run through some questions, okay? And ask yourself this. How much do I dislike it when people, A, blue tick me, B, refuse to acknowledge me, especially at group settings, C, give me unsolicited advice for my life, especially church leaders sometimes, right? Pastors especially. D, pretend to care for me, but not keep their word. E, show off, especially with an ability I'm better at. How many of us dislike it when people do these things? Pride is essentially competitive. Thus, the Chinese saying, and I had to get this right, okay, because <laughs> at the time when I try something Chinese or Hokkien, I always after that get messages <laughs> correcting me, uh, that one mountain cannot contain two tigers. Ishan Purong, Erhu. Initially, I wrote two dragons, okay? But pride, pride gets no pleasure out of merely having something. Pride gets pleasure having more of it than the next person. When we, we say that people are proud of being rich, smart, or good-looking, but that is not true. They are proud of being richer smarter or better looking than others. If someone else became equally rich, equally smart, equally good looking, then there is nothing to be proud of. It is comparison that makes one proud and be able to enjoy the pleasure of being above the rest. Once the element of competition is gone, pride is gone as well. As C.S. Lewis said, there is no fault which makes a man more unpopular and no fault which we are more unconscious of in ourselves than pride. And the more we have it in ourselves, I know this will be very true for myself as well, the more we dislike it in others. But the greatest irony is that for all its promises of strength and invulnerability, Pride has the exact opposite effect on us. It makes us weak. It makes us vulnerable. It makes, us, makes our egos fragile. It makes us brittle. It makes us easy to break. The moment somebody gives a negative comment, the defensive walls are up. And we go into a defensive posture by default, ready to strike. <laughs> but some of us really strike first, preemptively, 
we launch a counter offense and attempt our best to discredit the offending party. And, and sometimes we are even tempted to scoff at the pathetically inferior attempt to challenge us. My thinking, ha, this person is not even in my league. What's he trying to do? Ultimately, it turns you into the kind of person that even people who truly care about you will walk on eggshells around. They would think thrice about telling you the truth about you. And slowly you'll find relationships around you either strained or dwindling or both. And this drags you into an endless cycle of anxiety and insecurity because pride will never settle for being second best in the eyes of others. So you lay low in a loud period of false humility to try to win people over only for that competitive desire to be the last say in everything, to manifest again. And then the cycle repeats itself for as long as you allow pride to dictate your life. So no, pride doesn't strengthen you. It only weakens you because it makes you easily susceptible to all kinds of mistakes the moment it has gripped your heart. And it will pierce your life with many kinds of griefs, and sorrows. So what can we do to counter pride then? <laughs> is it just, all oh, hope is lost, and so, uh, you know, such a sad story? Nah. Another Christian author, great Christian author, John Stott said, pride is your greatest enemy, and humility is your greatest friend. Why did he say so? Because humility, humility strengthens you. When you humbly accept the help and wisdom of others, you will almost always only be strengthened, not weakened. The problem is that when we think of humility, you know, we think of it in terms of our cultural norms, that it is a form of weakness. It does not make you stand out in the crowd. It makes you blend into it. You just become another face in the crowd. And that's not good for any career or any advancement of relationships. Nobody just wants to be a, a C or a D performing employee. And that's because we haven't realized that humility is not humiliation. Now, humiliation is the very thing that pride seeks to avoid at all costs because it's the state when pride is injured because we feel ashamed and foolish. No one enjoys being humiliated, right? I'm sure all of us here can think back about a humiliating moment in our lives, whether trivial, like not having your zip zipped up and somebody else has to tell you, or more or deeper emotional things. And whatever yours may be, one thing is for sure, even years later, for some, the emotional pain, and for others, the feelings of embarrassment are still vivid in our minds whenever we think back up to such incidents. And we don't want to ever experience these feelings again. So, we, so if we erroneously think of humility interchangeably with humiliation, no wonder why we do not consider humility a good thing. And this is made even tougher when culture teaches us that being humble is similar to something like having low self-esteem. Easy. Let's define this. When we are asked, how does a humble person speak? What would most of us think of quite instinctively? What would you say? How does a humble person behave or speak? Okay, shy to say, right? But most of us would think of a humble person discrediting, discrediting himself or herself almost immediately. Something like, oh, no, nah, that was not me. Hey, you did a good job. Hey, no, 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 that was not me. Lah. Oh, it was like everyone else. No, 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 not me, not me. And we think of this as if a humble person has low self-esteem. And in a society that is obsessed with having a good self-esteem to make it in life, like why now all tertiary institutions have this thing called class part, right? Uh, I don't know whether you're here would, uh, would, would, would identify with that, but now they try to make everybody speak out in classes, class participation. In the society where 
having good self-esteem to make it in life is a desirable trait. This further adds stigma on being humble. However, what humility really is, as once again, C.S. Lewis brilliantly puts it, humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. It's being, it's being not obsessed with yourself. A humble person is not someone who constantly feels a, a sense of embarrassment and shame, you know, nor is that person constantly thinking that, hey, I'm worthless and unable to do anything, right? Rather, the humble person is simply just not obsessed with comparing himself or herself with other people and trying to be superior. In other words, a humble person has a right view of God and ourselves in relation to others. And this will have a profound effect on our relationships with others. For as John Chrysostom said, humility is the root, mother, nurse, foundation, and bond of all virtue. So what does humility get you? Jesus says in Matthew 23, 12, that those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. How can we put on true humility? Well, to do so, we must consider the ultimate personification of humility in Jesus Christ. Remember the ageless tactic of the devil that I just shared about, right? To get all of us to sin by appealing to our pride. Well, uh, the joker tried it on Jesus as well in Matthew 4. And he tried to tempt Jesus with the lust of the flesh, Knowing that after 40 days in the wilderness, he was hungry, he told Jesus, turn these stones into bread. Then the devil tempted Jesus with the pride of life by bringing him to the highest point of the temple in the holy city and asking Jesus to throw himself down if he were really the son of God. And finally, the devil tempted Jesus with the lust of the eyes by bringing him to a high place where he could see all the kingdoms of the world in their splendor and say, I will promise all these things to you if only you would bow down and worship me. But with each temptation where Eve only grew in greater resolve to take charge of her life that ultimately led to the demise of her resistance towards the devil, Jesus, on the other hand, only strengthened in his resolve because he remained in humble obedience towards his Father in heaven. Let's read Jesus' steadfast humility uh, that led to the devil leaving him in Matthew 4, 8 to 11. And it says this. This is the last temptation, okay? Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. You know, when I think about this, right, actually the devil is quite foolish to think that something that worked on the created would work on the creator. By the very act of leaving heaven, coming to earth, taking the form of a man, Jesus already demonstrated an indescribable humbling of himself. Throughout his life on earth, Jesus showed that spirit of profound humility, saying in Matthew 20, 28, that he came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And from this verse, the popular notion of a servant leader has been coined and is the benchmark standard for leadership, no matter which industry you go to. On his last night with his disciples, he also washed their feet and instructed them that this is the example of servanthood with one another. Why? Well, if you haven't washed anyone's feet before, I must tell you that it is a truly humbling experience. My second year in Phnom Penh, during our retreat, we did this, and it was really a particularly remarkable memory because, especially in Khmer culture, I, I think I said, I've shared this with you before, the feet are regarded as the dirtiest part of the body, very similar to ancient culture in Jesus' time. So you're not allowed to sit in a way with your feet, your exposed feet, pointing at someone or 
uh, showing to someone when guests are in your home. You are supposed to sit in a way that your feet are planted on the ground and not pointing at anyone. But as the church in Phnom Penh at that time, as we read the example of Jesus, as we were washing each other's feet, there were many spontaneous moments of tears from love that stem from Christ-like humility towards one another. Nobody said anything, you know. We were just washing each other's feet and people just started crying, hugging each other after that. There is absolutely no other teaching that would ask you to stoop so low, quite literally. To do what only slaves, and in fact, the lowliest of slaves were asked to do. And if the creator of the heavens and earth did it, we really do not have an excuse not to. And I will always point to that event as a pivotal moment in the Phnom Penh church being truly established as relationships all over were genuinely strengthened from that day forth. It allowed us to do what the Apostle Paul encouraged all believers to reflect on so that we can adopt the attitude and actions of Jesus and follow his example of humility. And this is what Paul says in Philippians 2, 3, 5. He says this, Do nothing out of selfish ambition and vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. To put on the mind of Christ, to, to have his, his values and his attitudes must become ours. As we refuse to be preoccupied with ourselves and our own importance, instead we should seek to love and serve others because this will reorient us from self-centeredness to other-centeredness. And that is not weakness, but strength. Because it finally enables you to take off that yoke of slavery in having your life dictated by competitive pride. It is strength. Because having removed that competitive spirit, you are now able to, amongst other things, readily admit your own faults when it's often easier to make up excuses and justify your way out of your own mess. It now enables you to readily recognize the gifts of others when it's often easier to put them down, especially if they outshine you in the same area. That's why there are so many workplace issues, right? And see, it helps you to readily accept praise when it's often easier to let flattery appeal to your heart instead. And over time, you become someone that everyone else wants to emulate. Like Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And no, this is not a formula for popularity. Rather, the aroma of a life that displays Christ-like humility will always permeate to the furthest corners. That's why Jesus said, the humble will be exalted even if they do not seek it. That's just the very nature of humility. It is attractive to truly possess. If you want to have the strength of humility, then perhaps the very first step is to recognize that we have pride and that is destructively weakening us. Finally, as you forsake pride and embrace humility, you'll find that the profound effect it will have on you is that you're now better able to love God and others in a deeply, personally satisfying way because love completes you. Now, humility and love are often closely intertwined in the Bible. But in Christianity, of the three great tenets, the three great gifts, faith, hope, and love, the greatest of these is love, as Paul tells us. Because it is said in 1 John 4, 16, that God is love. Being humble liberates us with that eureka moment that the lifestyle of prideful self-sufficiency ironically falls short, always, 
And it, it leads us to conclude that we need more than just a willful reliance on self to get through life. Then it enables us to contemplate that we need to love beyond our mere selves. And finally, the breakthrough happens when we start loving God and others. And in doing so, experience the fullest measure of being loved and known in the deepest possible way by our loving Creator God. Humility and love are both about one central issue, the importance of persons. Turn to your neighbours and say, you are important. Vicious pride, which is what humility eliminates, is thinking, feeling, and caring about one's own importance in distorted and corrupt ways. And love is thinking, feeling, and caring about other people's importance in the right, godly way. That is why pride throws up spiritual walls between people, preventing our communion in love. And it's why humility, by eliminating the walls of pride, liberates us to love our neighbour. Because to love is to be humbled. It, it takes all of who we are to love. We have all known costs in loving people. When we love one another, we reflect who God is because God is love. When we are humbled before God to love despite all else, despite the costs, we are submitting to His great commandment of loving God with all that we have and our neighbours as ourselves. And there is a simple reason why, no matter how difficult it may be for some of us, we can put ourselves out there to love. We can. We can. The simple reason is this. We love because He first loved us. Consider this story. There was once a king who fell in love with a beautiful village girl. How can he win her heart in marriage? If he orders her to marry him, it would not be right. Then she will only be a slave against her will or someone who wants his wealth and not be that true soulmate the king is looking for. So the king decides that, decided that he would take off his royal robes, put on the clothes of a common man, and he moved into the village and lived amongst them. He shared their pain, their joy, their food, and talked and spoke their language. It was not just a disguise. It was a completely new identity. Over time, the king managed to win over the heart of the girl and they got married. You can say that she loved because he first loved her. And this is what Jesus Christ did for you and me over 2,000 years ago. He put aside his kingly role and put on flesh and blood and came to live amongst us. He came in the form of a humble servant who washed his disciples' feet. Yet, he was truly the king. Why did he do so? I believe for two very important reasons. The first one is this. He wanted us to know his everlasting love for us that will redeem us from the deathly effects of Adam and Eve's sin in the Garden of Eden. Number two, so that we may love one another through his love. Because it's not instinctive to love other people, especially when it comes with a cost. And the Apostle Paul, uh, John tells us this beautifully. As I was reading these verses again, I thought they were really beautiful in uh, 1 John 4, 10 to 12, it says this, This is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and His love is made complete in us. His love completes you and me. The reason we will love others best when we love God most is that love in its truest, purest form only comes from God because God is love. 
Love is a fundament, fundamental part of his nature. We are only able to love him or anyone else because he first loved us. We are only able to give freely to others what we have received freely from him. And then, in this freedom, we are confronted with two choices. We are confronted to choose between getting hurt through prideful strife or joyful intimacy in our, through, through humility and love in our relationships with one another. And should we choose to love others, there is a very practical benefit to it. First Peter 4, it tells us, above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. The most wonderful thing happens when we love each other with a deep love. A multitude of sins is covered. Now, what does this mean? First, it means that when we love, we choose not to react in knee-jerk, angry retaliation. I asked the first service this, don't believe me? You try to slap your neighbour now. Second, it means that when we love, we choose to release the very real negative feelings building up within us despite the wrong done to us. And third, it means that when we love, we are more likely to take the first step and reach out to those who have wronged us to forgive and reconcile. The choice Christians have is twofold. We can either cover up sin or cover it. To cover up sin is to pretend that it doesn't exist. Within ourselves, it means that we make justifications for sin. Or in those times when we know we cannot justify our sins, we become like Adam and Eve. We hide from God, pretending that He doesn't know. And in each case, sin festers within us and destroys us. And when it comes to our fellow members of the Christian community, we cover up sin by holding another sin against them as justification to push them away from Christian community and from our lives. We allow another's failings and mistakes to dictate our vision of their identity. In doing so, we make the Christian community nothing more than a dream. Wishful thinking. Our version of Christian community becomes an exaltation of ourselves, where everyone is called to be who I wish them to be and does what I, want, I would want them to. Yet here, there is no love for there is no acceptance. But to cover sin, as Peter tells us, is to recognize that the love of Jesus forgives sin within ourselves and within others. That all of us stand on the same ground. It is to root ourselves on the solid basis of Christ's love and forgiveness. Thus, we make the love of Jesus the ground upon which we all stand. And this puts, puts things in correct perspective. And thus, the ground upon which we accept, embrace, and serve others. What might it look like to allow Christ's love flowing within us to overcome another's weakness, sinfulness, or imperfection? How might we allow the love of Jesus to change the way we view those who are different than us? Love covers a multitude of sins because it embraces the other. It receives the other. It serves the other. And this is not something that we as members of the Christian community are only, to only say. We are also to express it with our lives and to express it radically so that the world may sit up and listen to our message of the cross of Jesus Christ. In the end, pride makes many empty promises, but don't fall for them. Instead, what you really want in true significance is found in displaying Christ-like humility and receiving a love that will complete you. For as Timothy Keller said, to be loved 
and truly loved is what we need more than anything. It liberates us from pretense, it humbles us out of our self-righteousness, and it fortifies us for any difficulty life can throw at us. May that be your personal revelation today and that you will always choose to be exalted by Christ in humility over being falsely exalted by your own pride.